So the origin of this started a few years ago when my wife and I were talking about being spiritual and working on spirituality and working with a lot of people working on it. And at one point she said to me, I thought spirituality was supposed to make life easier, right? <laughs> I thought I'm supposed to be more relaxed and more casual and comfortable and happy with spirituality. And of course, many, 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 many times that's true. It obviously is the case. But there's a certain intensity that comes with it as well. That sort of confused me, because I always had this idea that you know, the more spiritual I became, the easier life would be. Au contraire, right? So what we're going to talk about today is a whole bunch of teachings that explain this so that you can know what's going on. I like to think of this as a perfect example of the tree of life. You don't want to eat off the tree of good and evil, it says in Genesis. You want to eat off the tree of life. Now, if you look at your suffering as bad somehow, you're eating off the wrong tree. You want to look at what you're going through as good somehow, or healthy for you somehow, and that's the tree of life. And so we're going to go through what exactly that is. Starting with the Kabbalah concept that uh, I was just reading the other day about suffering. And they explain that what happens to the person on a spiritual journey is that you are a metaphysical vessel. Okay? This is, you know, from the book New Eyes, atoms are vessels of light, that's what they are. Our bodies are actually vessels of light, scientifically and spiritually, that's what we are. Kabbalah has a word for it, it's called the Kli. It's a vessel in which you put light in. And all of us have that. Now, when you become more spiritual, it's like becoming going from being a baby to a toddler, to an eight-year-old, to a preteen, to a teenager. Your vessel grows. It's just a good way to think of it. It grows or it has a greater capacity, however you want to visualize that. And so it's called the expansion of the metaphysical vessel. Now that process ultimately comes with growing pains. Just like kids get a little bit older and their joints and their ligaments and you know, all that kind of stuff, it can be a little bit difficult. And a bunch of other examples we'll be talking about in a second. But it's actually part of the process. There's going to be pain in the growth process. And it's a metaphysical vessel thing. Now, one of my favorite concepts of all in the Bible, which I don't hear mentioned in church too often, is a pretty aggressive thing Jesus says in Luke 12, 47. He says, when you know your master's will, and you do not make ready according to his will, you will receive a severe beating. Okay? Yeah. Now, I often say, Jesus isn't this peacenik, hippie guy that hugged it out all the time. He said, you're going to get a beating. All right? Right there in Luke 12, 47. Right? And you don't see that on, like, Christmas cards that often. <laughs> The fact is, he says you're going to get a beating. Oh, there will be no. <laughs> and, and he says in the rest of this, if you don't know your master's will and you do what deserves a beating, your beating will be less severe, which is a light beating. I say that's God graded on a curve. The fact is, some vessels get beat differently than other vessels, using Jesus' words. Okay? Well, what does that mean? The bigger the vessel you are, the more of the beating you're going to get if you don't do your master's will. Okay? That means more pain the more spiritual you become. Not less. That's not a bad thing, though, which we're going to go through. So a way to think of it is who's more responsible in the relationship between a teacher and a student? You had a teacher at school, then you have a third grader. Who's more responsible? That's logical, right? Very logical. Who's more responsible in the relationship between a parent and a child? Or who ought to be more responsible? <laughs> okay, logical. Well, who should be more responsible in a spiritual relationship? The little vessel or the big vessel? Of course, with growth of vessel or spiritual development, you become more responsible. That means more responsibility, more burden. Also, more potential pitfalls, which we will go through in a second. So, backing this up, I'm going to use a couple quotes from uh, Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. One wonderful line he says is, When your senses are controlled, but you keep recalling sense objects with your mind, you are a self-deluded hypocrite. Jesus likes to use the word hypocrite a lot, too. So does Krishna. You're a self-deluded hypocrite when your senses are controlled. What does that mean? The physical senses, once you understand what they are, and you're not obsessed with flesh anymore, and you recognize the point of using them for just observing this illusion of a world, once you've got that down, but you keep falling into the trap, the ego trap of the senses, and you keep perceiving the world in a physical way, you're a self-deluded hypocrite. Now, if you don't know this, if you don't know if your senses aren't controlled and you are still asleep walking around in a physical world thinking it's physical, you're not a hypocrite. 
okay? Because you're just doing what you should be doing. Third graders tend to believe in Santa Claus, right? That's what they should be believing in. Usually by senior year in high school, you're done with that, usually. Okay, I hope not too many third graders watch this. <laughs> the fact is, once you know the world is a spiritual world, and you go back to acting as if it's a physical world, you're a self-deluded hypocrite, and that's where the severe beating comes in. You don't get to flinch. So, uh, two other lines in the Gita. I love this here. Arjuna, who represents us, Arjuna says to Krishna, My mind is faltering, violent, strong, and stubborn. I find it as difficult to hold as the wind. Okay? He's trying to stay focused, but my gosh, is it hard. He's like fighting against his own mind. He can't shut it up. It's, it's hard to hold on to that focus. And Krishna counsels him, without a doubt, the mind is unsteady and hard to hold, but practice can restrain it, Arjuna. If you strive to master yourself, a man has the means to reach it. What does that mean? You're supposed to stay focused, right? Because if your mind starts to wander and wave and you fall off the spiritual path, severe beatings, right? We got to stay focused. So here we got Krishna saying the same thing you are going to have to stay focused or you're going to experience a severe beating. So the kitchen sink in this Buddhist text, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, it says, paraphrasing quickly here, that the ego is the thing that's going to keep trying to knock you off your path. Okay? The ego is the other part of your mind that is ultimately the defense trying to keep you from scoring. Okay? And the author says here, as soon as you enter the kitchen sink period on the spiritual path, the teachings which have touched you deeply, unavoidably, you are faced with the truth of yourself. The ego gets revealed and its sore spots are then touched and all sorts of problems start arising. Right? Because what you're trying to work on is the spiritual development. The ego is saying, no, 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 I want you to stay stuck here on earth, in hell really. And it's going to point out every one of your issues. Every one of them. That's what's supposed to happen. You're going to struggle because the kitchen sink gets thrown at you, right? Because you don't get to get through life without getting all of that burned out. I like to say if you're really thirsty, you're really thirsty, and I offer you water, but right before I give you the water, I drop one drop of Ebola virus in it. You're thirsty, right? Here, drink the water. You're like, ah, no, I don't want that in there. That's still poison, right? It's the same thing with the clea and the spiritual vessel. You don't get any ego in there. It has to be all eliminated. And so the more spiritual you become, the more those sore spots are noticed. You've got tons of sore spots all over you. It's really no big deal. But it becomes more glaring, and then the world just throws the kitchen sink at you. Okay? Now, what is that doing? That is actually teaching you how to focus because the beating feels worse. It's much more challenging as a result, whereas when you are ignorant and are not aware of, this, aware of this, it doesn't hurt as bad. So, in John 16, 21 and 22, Jesus explains this perfectly well. He compares this process to childbirth. Right? What happens in childbirth? Sounds like a good idea. We're going to have a baby. Right? Off to a good start. Especially in the very beginning. <laughs> and then over the course of nine months, things start to get incrementally more difficult somehow, right? Baby starts to grow. Not that I know any of this, but, you know, please acknowledge that it probably it looks that way. Baby starts to grow, more pain. You're getting closer, more exciting, but boy, it's still more difficult, isn't it? And then the delivery comes. What are contractions, for goodness sakes? I hear it's a lot of pain, right? That's pain. And then it remits for a little bit. Then there's more contractions, and then it remits, and then there's contractions, and it's intense, right? But why do women go through with this? The baby's on the way, and they understand what's happening. Why for thousands of years have women been doing this other than they know there's a reward at the end, if you want to call that a reward? It's coming, and so you put up with it. Life is exactly like that. We've got contractions. It's the pain. It's the suffering. It's the kitchen sink. It's all of this stuff, the severe beating. But it remits, doesn't it? Oh, you have a chance to breathe. That's God being merciful. And then here comes the contraction again, and then it remits, and then the contraction again. And the whole thing is purifying you. Because you're giving birth to Christ in your heart. That's what's happening. So how does Jesus say it? It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. 
So with you, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can take that or rob that from you. Okay? When you've delivered the baby, when the Christ is inspired inside of you, and you've given birth to it, if you will, you got it. It's good to go. It's also the joy. You've earned it, so to speak. You've revealed it inside of yourself, and that's the whole process. There are labor pains. Paul says the same thing. I'm with you in childbirth. Like these guys know about the physical aspect of... No, that's not what they're talking about. They know that it's a spiritual thing. So to make it simple, I like to compare it to just walking on the floor versus walking on a tightrope. Walking across the floor is really no big deal. I won't impress you if I do that. Okay? But if I put a 2 by 4 right here and I walk across that, I have to be a little more focused. That's walking across the floor. That's on a 2 by 4 just a couple feet off the ground. It's probably not going to hurt that much if I fall, and I better be more focused, but it is harder than walking across the floor. So if I'm on a tightrope 50 feet up, I better stay real focused, right? What happens if I fall off a tightrope from 50 feet? Severe beating, right? You have to stay focused. It's the same thing Krishna was saying. Oh, man, the mind is hard to hold on to. I know what I need to do, and yet I keep losing it. Forgiveness being a great example of this. We all know we need to forgive, but it's hard to get to. We keep coming up with all these reasons not to. Severe beating. Right? So now you're on a spiritual journey, and you're on a tightrope, and you're up really high, and you've got to stay focused. And what starts happening? The kitchen sink gets thrown at you. <laughs> Bullets are being fired at you. Right? Hornets start swirling around you. And if you start to try to swat at the hornets, right, what's going to happen? You're going to fall right off. Another a good example of this is if I'm walking my tightrope, and Scott's walking one right next to me, and I start going, hey, Scott. Right? I'm supposed to follow my path. I'm not supposed to judge his path. I got to stay focused on my path. What were Buddha's last words? Strive for your own liberation with diligence. Stay in your own tightrope. Jesus, do not worry about the speck in their eye. You got to log in your own, right? Follow my tightrope. Let's not get in arguments with people about this because you follow yours, I follow mine. I'll see you on the other side. That's the point. Now, I stay focused on my tightrope. I'm less likely to fall. So what's going on? All the pain, all the suffering, all of the severe beatings is teaching me how to focus, right? It's helping me stay focused only on the spirit. So what does Jesus say about this? If your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. Single eye means this eye, not these eyes. He restored sight to the blind by helping people see with this eye again the spiritual eye. And if that eye, single, if that eye sees only the spirit, the whole body gets filled with the light. That's our journey, to get filled with the light. This metaphysical vessel, Kabbalah means to receive. This explains the book called Zohar, which means radiant light. We are here to get filled with the radiant light. Your process is to expand this vessel and fill it with the light. That's all we're supposed to be doing. If you get distracted, that vessel doesn't get filled. But if you stay focused in any all things, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That vessel is filled. Now you're going to stay on that tightrope, and whatever comes your way, you're going to have a sense of peace about it. You lose any of that focus, you fall off that tightrope, and that is called a severe beating. All of this is just teaching you how to stay focused. That's the point of pain. That's the point of suffering. Once you know that, like a woman in childbirth, you can endure it. And then you can say to each other, why does Paul say we rejoice in our sufferings? Because he understood what was happening. So when you're suffering, and I'm suffering, and we support each other in our suffering by saying, hey, good job, Scott, you're delivering a baby. It's so much more easy to endure when we know there's a point. God doesn't waste a single moment. There's not any of this suffering that's happened on earth that's wasted. If you endure it the right way, you speed up this process, you, you, you come into the light much quicker, and that's what makes it the tree of life.